Hello, my name is Arun Vamori. I'm with the DHS Science and Technology Directorate, Biometric and Identity Technology Center. Thank you for joining us for this webinar today, discussing facial recognition and going over the performance and equitability of these systems. I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr. John Howard and Dr. Yevgeny Sirotin. So as we begin this webinar, we're gonna talk a little bit more about what is the Biometric and Identity Technology Center, and we'll provide you an overview of what is facial recognition. So we'll make a distinction about what it is and what it isn't. We'll also talk about some of our specific work in evaluating biometric technologies, in particular facial recognition systems, so that we can discuss how we are working to promote performance of these systems and make sure that they work well for everyone. Uh, and then finally, we'll close out with a couple of case studies and talk about specific examples of how we've considered specific types of issues and errors that we've observed through testing and provide actionable information back out to the people who build these systems to make them better over time. So the Biometric and Identity Technology Center is designed to provide subject matter expertise and objective information across DHS users and stakeholders. Through technology discovery, independent test and evaluation, and development of knowledge projects, ST is providing resources to focus on improving the performance of these systems and providing better information to DHS components who are charged with implementing new technologies and processes. Our aim is to provide objective information to assist DHS components and stakeholders in learning about how these technologies work when considering, planning, or using these technologies in operations. We also work closely with industry and academia to orient them to specific challenges in operations and work with them to develop more effective solutions and ways to mitigate challenges in performance. So on this slide, we have a few examples of headlines talking about the use of facial recognition technologies in various real world applications. Uh, the technologies can be used as part of the, the travel continuum to help improve uh, traveler experience and speed up queues. Uh, it can be used to, for various criminal uh, or for various law enforcement applications in either detecting imposters or uh, combating identity theft, and then also to help identify missing persons, including uh, combating uh, child sex exploitation and trafficking. And now I'll turn this over to Dr. John Howard to provide more of an overview of facial recognition systems. Thanks, Arun. So we saw on the last slide that face recognition has a couple of uses that would be of interest to DHS, things like speeding travel, detecting fraud, and finding missing persons. What we're going to discuss next is exactly what is facial recognition, and perhaps more importantly, what it is not. Uh, we're going to do this because we think when discussing new technology, uh, particularly technology that impacts the public at large, using the right terminology and being concise with your language is really important. Uh, face recognition systems are complicated pieces of technology, but they really boil down to a few key parts. First, face recognition systems are designed to identify humans, so at the end of any face recognition system, you'll find a person. That person has his or her picture taken by some kind of camera. This can be anything from a point-and-shoot disposable to a phone to a specifically designed facial recognition camera, but regardless, the output is the same. It's a picture of that person's face. This stage of the larger face recognition process is called image acquisition. Uh, people often overlook the image acquisition part of a face recognition system workflow, but it's actually a really crucial component to the overall process. Uh, when testing how well image acquisition systems work, you need to consider a couple of things. First, usability. How easy is it for that human to interact with the camera system so that a good picture is taken? Are the instructions clear, for example? Sensor quality. Does the camera take a good picture, or is it blurry, off-center, overexposed, etc.? Does it take a good picture for all kinds of people? Short, tall, light, dark, male, female. Uh, next, face detection algorithms. Can we reliably pick a face out from all the other background information in a given picture? And finally, opting in and out. Are we collecting face images only from people who meant to interact with the system, and not inadvertently collecting images from people in the background as well? Once we have a picture of a person from a camera, we compare that picture to another picture using a computer program or a computer algorithm. The output of that process answers the question, are two pictures of the same person or different people? This part of the face recognition system is called image matching. There's a lot of focus on how well computer programs perform this act of image matching, and rightfully so. Matching is a critical part of the overall face recognition workflow, but it isn't the only part. When testing how well computer programs are at comparing two faces, we have to worry about a couple of things. First, image selection. How do we select the best images to provide to a computer program? Algorithm. What computer programs are best at telling if two people are the same or different? And finally, if we have multiple pictures or multiple algorithms in our face recognition system, how do we fuse the results of those things together 
derive at this final same different person conclusion. That last task we call fusion. Uh, finally, in order for a face recognition system to sort of be useful, uh, there's this third part called image galleries. The purpose of an image gallery is to associate faces to known identities because it doesn't really help us to know that two face pictures are of the same person if you don't actually know who one of those people is to begin with. The characteristics of an image gallery can affect the performance of a face recognition system. For example, how many people are in our image gallery and what are the demographics of those people, whether they're all a particular age or gender, for example. And then finally, uh, image source, where did those images come from? Were they all taken by the same camera, the same set of people under the same lighting conditions? Uh, answering all those questions uh, can affect the overall accuracy in some kinds of facial recognition systems. Many people listening to this might have heard of another kind of new technology that uses a picture of your face uh, in a computer program called facial analysis or facial classification. It's important to know that these two technologies are not the same and in fact do very different things. As we described on the last slide, face recognition programs measure the similarity between two faces. So in the case of these two emojis you see on the left, they're clearly not the same person. A face recognition program would give us the conclusion of different people. The easiest way to tell if a computer is performing a face recognition task is if it requires two or more faces in order to make a determination and if it's answering questions about how similar those two faces are. Facial classification, on the other hand, is very different. It works on a single image, which is submitted to a different kind of computer program, which then attempts to label that image with a whole host of word descriptions. In this case, a facial classification program might tell you thing like, things like, there's a person in this photo, it's a male, he's wearing a blue shirt, and he has blonde hair. Facial classification programs are easily spotted because they only operate on a single image. They describe the person in the image, but they don't produce individualistic identity information. For example, just because I know an image contains a person, a picture of a blonde male, it doesn't tell you who is precisely in that photo. There's a lot of blonde males in the world. Although both face recognition and face classification use faces and computers, they're fundamentally different things, they have fundamentally different goals, and they make very different kinds of errors. Most importantly, error rates in face classification do not mean that those same error rates occur in face recognition. In fact, there are existing reports out there from our research group and others that show significantly lower rates, lower error rates when using face recognition versus face classification. Uh, these last two points that face recognition and face classification are different and that it's hard to draw conclusions from one using another are unfortunately confused by a lot of people. It's actually really understandable. A lot of technology providers, particularly those who sell their services in cloud platforms, bundle classification and recognition together under the same service. It's also frankly not helpful when trying to inform the public debate about these technologies. However, it is important to note that for DHS and really all government use cases, face recognition and face classification aren't used interchangeably. They can't be because they do different things. Popular news articles also haven't helped in this regard. You can see a sample on this slide of news articles from very reputable sources that have gotten it wrong or at least confused the concept of face recognition and face classification. These are really just a couple of examples. There's dozens uh, more out there. And it's why we see it as crucial to emphasize today that not only recognition and classification of faces are different, but that lessons learned about the performance of one technology don't necessarily apply to the other. Uh, now we'd like to talk about a concept we call equitability as it applies to face recognition. Uh, as I'm sure everyone listening to this presentation is aware, most DHS use cases for biometrics are gonna need to work well in a diverse body of people. DHS components operate ports of entry across the United States, United States, and as such, they encounter people from all over the world. One of the missions of the DHS Biometrics and Identity Technology Center is to ensure that biometric systems are both deployed and planned to be deployed by DHS work well for all kinds of people. Specifically, we want to encourage industry to develop face recognition systems that are efficient for everyone, meaning they don't take longer for certain groups. We want to encourage industry to develop face recognition systems that are effective for everyone, meaning they work well for all groups. And lastly, we want to encourage industry to develop face recognition systems that are satisfying to use for everyone. We label systems that meet these criteria as equitable, and equitability is a core performance metric we look for when we evaluate face recognition systems. As the evaluator of face recognition systems, we know that these systems, like all technology, can make errors. We think it's convenient to think about these errors along the same system component boundaries we discussed earlier. For example, when a face recognition system takes a picture of a person's face, it can fail to take a good photo. 
one that is free of blur and has good contrast. Cameras can also sometimes take a picture of a person's face in the background instead of the person that's interacting with the device. These are all problems with image acquisition that we test for. When matching two photos of a person, a face recognition system can mistakenly say that two photos of the same person don't really look like each other. We call that a false non-match. Face recognition systems can also say that two photos of different people look like each other. We call that a false match. These are different kinds of errors, and just because one happens doesn't mean the other is going to happen. Finally, the composition of the image galleries is also important to consider, uh, is also important when considering the error rates of facial recognition systems. For example, if you're trying to use a face recognition system in an office building, and someone forgot to enroll a picture of you in that system, it's probably not gonna work. Uh, while understanding the various sources of errors is important, uh, testing for the frequency of different kinds of errors in facial recognition, facial recognition systems is even more important. Uh, fortunately, the US government has a long track record of such testing. The National Institutes of Standards and Technology, for example, or NIST, has been testing facial recognition systems since at least the year 2000. That's almost 20 years. Uh, NIST testing shows that error rates have been steadily decreasing with these systems, and in fact, just over the last three years, uh, the gains have been really remarkable decreasing into the sub 1% level just recently in 2018. Uh, some algorithms tested in the NIST evaluations have been shown, well, shown to work well for people of different races, genders, and most age groups. NIST has also seen a notable increase in the number of new algorithms it evaluates, many of which perform very well, but a small portion of which continue to struggle with high error rates. We think this highlights the importance uh, and the value of the NIST face recognition testing protocol However, as we pointed out on the previous slide, algorithms are only part of the face recognition system, and additional testing on other parts is also needed to ensure the full system works well for everyone. Recognizing the need to supplement algorithm testing with objective evaluations of full biometric systems, DHS s and planned out a comprehensive biometric evaluation program in 2011 and set up a dedicated test facility in Maryland to identify systems that work well on diverse groups of people. Two years later, uh, evaluations of commercial biometric systems began in earnest, eventually leading to the DHS s and biometric technology rallies, which began in 2018, continued in 2019, and are planned for 2020. We began publishing reports on these evaluations, including reports on equitability around 2016. Uh, you can see that studying these issues properly takes a lot of time and careful planning. Uh, to date, the Biometrics and Identity Technology Center continues to test full biometric systems at the Maryland Test Facility. We've responsibly collected data using mechanisms like informed consent and being supervised by a research review board since 2014. Uh, in this manner, we've tested dozens of commercial biometric systems and over 2,500 volunteer test participants. So we want to point out that the testing we conduct at the Maryland Test Facility is not just academic or scientific in nature. It's resulted in real-world improvements to commercial biometric products for DHS and various stakeholders across industry. Uh, for example, just between the 2018 and the 2019 biometric technology rallies, we saw a nearly 50% reduction in average processing time, down from 6.2 seconds to 3.6 seconds. This might not sound like a significant decrease, but when you're talking about trying to biometrically process thousands of individuals, such as at an airport or border crossing, uh, this kind of time saving can really have a notable impact. Uh, while realizing this time reduction, we also saw an overall increase in system effectiveness, essentially an increase in the system match rate from 89 to 95%. Again, seemingly small, but that's a 50% reduction in the number of people that need help using these biometric systems. Uh, finally, both these gains came in conjunction with an overall increase in the satisfaction of the general public in using these systems. That was up from 92 to 94%. I think in today's day and age, it's actually quite remarkable to find a technology that 94% of people are satisfied using, uh, but that seems to be what happened with at least some of these biometric systems we tested, which I think is pretty good. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Sroten, who's gonna talk about some concrete examples and uh, eventually offer some conclusions. Thank you. So as part of our research on full biometric systems, we're able to see how well these technologies work for different people, and not only identify differences in performance, but get to the root cause of each issue. Ultimately, these systems are designed and built by engineers, and engineers do very well when provided with specific requirements. On the other hand, it is hard for engineers to know what to adjust when instructed broadly to make a system work well for everyone. In addition, different engineers work on different parts of the system, so we have to specify what must be changed for each part. Our testing gives us a unique insight into what specifically must be adjusted 
so we can tell the engineers working in industry what they should fix. I will now take you through three case studies showing how differences in performance observed during our testing have mapped onto specific system components and led to specific recommendations suitable for engineers to take action. In this first case study, we noticed that some face recognition systems we tested had lower performance for women compared to men. We knew about recent studies that showed some face classification technologies don't work well on women. Was this the same thing happening in some of the face recognition systems we were testing? Was it a failure of the system to detect women's faces? When we examined the images returned by the system, which you could see on the right, uh, we realized the true cause. It turned out that the system designers positioned the camera such that faces of shorter people, not just women, were cut off in the frame. This caused an obvious problem with face recognition. Since women tend to be a little shorter than men, on average, we saw this as a gender effect in our statistical testing. We also saw that systems with better field of view did not have such gender effects. So the system component that needed to be adjusted in this case is image acquisition. And our recommendation to industry engineers was to ensure that camera placement accommodate all people by height. This is a far more specific recommendation than saying make sure your system works well for men and women. It is also an example of a performance difference that was correlated with a demographic group, in this case gender, but was actually caused by other factors, in this case height. We think it shows the importance of doing detailed analysis when investigating technology performance across demographic groups. For the second case study, we noticed that some face recognition systems we tested had lower performance for people that self-identified as black or African American than for those that self-identified as white. Because of the unique way in which we test face recognition systems, we were able to determine how different parts of the system contributed to this problem. Was it an issue with the recognition algorithm and how it was developed? Was it an issue with the way the images were acquired? To check if this problem was specific to recognition, we took a single recognition system and used it to match faces acquired on different tested acquisition systems. What we found was that for some acquisition systems, performance was poor for people with darker skin. But for others, the performance was almost identical across skin color. When we looked at the images of people from the poor performing acquisition systems, uh, what we saw was that they were producing visibly poorer quality images for people with darker skin, as the example on my right shows as a comparison between a poor camera image and a good camera image of a subject with darker skin. The good cameras produced excellent images regardless of skin color. This quality issue where some cameras took poorer pictures of some people contributed to the poorer performance for people of color in our study. So the system component that needed to be adjusted in this case is again image acquisition. And our research translated the broad requirement to have systems work well for all races to a specific recommendation for industry engineers to ensure that sensors and systems produce quality images for all skin types. Our final case study deals with false positive errors that uh, Dr. Howard alluded to earlier. We found that some people tended to have higher odds of being incorrectly identified as someone else. We wanted to understand whether people belonging to different demographic groups were differently affected by this error. First off, we found that face recognition algorithms were more likely to make false positive errors between people of similar age, similar gender, and similar race and that they made such errors for all demographic groups. To my right, you see some images of people uh, from different demographic groups, uh, which are actually each a false positive error. So the person on the left is different than the person on the right, but the face recognition algorithm thought that they were the same. We also saw that people in some demographic groups tended to have a greater likelihood of a false positive to other people in their group. And that's what the uh, chart to the right shows. However, generally, we saw that this was a low probability, below 1%, at the configuration that we were using. We found, however, that no single demographic factor explained this variation in performance. For example, in our study, older black men were least affected by the error, whereas older white men were the most affected. We found that no single factor, older versus younger, black or white, male or female, could neatly explain the performance variation. Put another way, the systems in our study did not work uniformly worse for females than males or Caucasians versus people of color or older versus younger people. 
Since we saw this effect with images from all cameras, we could narrow down the problem to the image matching component. Our recommendation to engineers in this case is to make sure that the algorithms perform well across multiple demographic intersections, since some groups in this study, older white men, may be more affected by the error than others. And now I'll hand things back over to Arun to close us out. Uh, so thanks, Evgeny. So in conclusion, we wanted to leave you with a few points. Uh, we wanted to help clarify what facial recognition systems are and what they are not. Uh, so facial recognition systems are systems. They involve multiple components, not just a matching algorithm. Facial recognition systems specifically do not classify people. They do not estimate male or female genders. They do not estimate emotions such as happy or sad. Uh, and also, facial recognition systems can also be very accurate and used very effectively to support many missions and many types of operations. Accuracy and equitability of facial recognition systems are important. Uh, facial recognition algorithms and biometric technologies in general have been studied by various government agencies for multiple decades. Uh, DHS Science and Technology Biometric and Identity Technology Center has per been performing full system testing through various scenarios for more than five years alone specifically to understand how various parts of the process can work and where errors start to introduce into the, into the overall technology. We've also hoped we've talked about DHS s and research efforts to help identify performance issues and equitability issues and where possible provide more concrete recommendations but then also back out to researchers to help identify and prioritize future research needs. So thank you today for your participation. So if you have any questions please reach out to peoplescreening at hq.dhs.gov. Uh, and to learn more about some of our research and some of our public testing, please visit mdtf.org. Again, on behalf of my colleagues John Howard and Evgeny Sorotin, we want to thank you for your participation in this video today.